Thank you for joining us for another power-packed message from Dr. Miles Monroe, provided by Monroe Global Incorporated and MonroeGlobal.com. We transform followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change. We hope that this message is a blessing to you as you advance your life and discover your purpose. Now, let's go into the message. Please write this down, the seven keys to planning change. The seven principles for planning change. I'm going to talk about Jesus' principles, and you'll have to be here next week to get the, the meat of this, but I want to focus on this segment understanding the priority and the goal of planning the most evident reality in life is change so write this statement down the only stability and security you have in life is change it's a paradox I repeat the only security and stability you have in life is change paradox in essence the only guarantee you have in life is transition I can guarantee you things will change as a guarantee therefore we must understand then that change cannot be avoided by any human or by any thing in creation plants are changing every second animals are changing every second rivers are changing every second you can never put your feet in the same place in a river never because the river is like life it's always moving therefore change is something we got to live with so here is my challenge to everyone under the sound of my voice if you cannot manage change you will never manage life young people please write this down if you cannot manage change you cannot manage life so I've come to a conclusion here's my conclusion life is simply a series of changes you used to be 10 remember you used to wear size 6 <laughs> oh to dream again you used to have hair I mean yours you used to not have breasts you used to hate boys I'm talking to the girls now only the girls change how many of you have walked into the closet and just dreamt oh to put that on again and the problem is you are so psychologically damaged you still keep it somehow you dream somewhere in the future 
that somehow by a miracle of God intervening on earth you will wear that dress again I got news for you it's over give it away bless somebody some of you are depressed when you go shopping lately because you got to go to the wrong rack you call it the wrong rack and the attendant says it is the right rack now change life is simply what a series of changes you used to be married husband died wife died got a divorce your kids used to be home worshiping you as a parent they're gone your son used to come to you for advice he getting advice now from his friends a series of changes and this is why life is so difficult because we don't want things to change the only way to stop changing is to stop living and that is why our declaration for this year is very important the Lord said to me we are entering a season of drastic changes and therefore this year is considered the year of change and new beginnings write this statement down the most common word that will be used in this season in your life is change it's already being used by many of you your job your status your relationships your business your career your position will change so don't anchor yourself to nothing in this season you will find yourself literally having to retool your life you will have to go back to school some of you to learn things you never knew because things changed on you you may need to take up a career that you hated before and now you fall in love with change why because the law of life is changed uh, I'm gonna make a statement I want you to get this CD so you can remember these statements number one change is the law of life and those who look only to the past or the present are certain to miss the future even the present cannot be trusted because it just left you a moment ago second note to write down if you want to make enemies try to change something in your life people don't want to change and they don't want you to change and they don't want things to change and so the moment you meet a person who wants to change things enemies are automatically created and therefore I want to read a statement from Dwight Eisenhower who was the president of the United States a powerful military general I love this statement he said I quote neither a wise man nor a brave man lies down on the tracks of history to wait for the train of the future to run over him I like that in other words if you don't wake up brother and realize that what you got you ain't gonna have tomorrow and what you claim may not be yours next month and if you don't get out of the road saying I ain't never gonna change the future will run you over therefore your life is not in your past it's in your future so spend more time 
focusing on where your life is. Where's your life? The future. And what we're focusing on in this series is that you got to plan your future. Or it will run over you like a freight train. What an amazing truth. Helen Keller said this about change. Remember she was mute. She was blind and she was dumb. Helen Keller said security is mostly a superstition. End quote. Period. See the period there? Say it with me. Security is mostly a superstition. This is heavy stuff. She said, look, anytime you think you are secure, you are suspicious. That's a superstition. In essence, it ain't true. You are never secure. This is why you need to put your faith in God, because only God doesn't change. The man who says he loves you, you wait a while. He's going to change on you. The woman said, I'll never leave you. And then she changed on you. You know, I was, when I teach marriage classes, I always tell young people, you know, they get excited about love and romance. And I tell them, look, uh, if you're going to marry a person, always study their parents. A parent is a prophet. No matter how he looks right now, study his father. You're going to wake up next to that one day. No matter how she looks right now, study her mother. You will wake up sleeping next to that one day. So if you can't handle the mother and the father, don't fool with this relationship. People change. She goes on to say, it does not exist in nature. What doesn't exist in nature? Security. I was driving past the western part of our island, past Sanders Beach. And I still see the sand on the other side of the road. And I used to wonder, why did those cedar trees stay there so long? Their roots were protecting the shoreline. Nature was saying, I got this. And then we initiated change, but didn't do research. So every time there's a northwestern or eastern wind, we're going to be scraping up sand because we change without planning. change. Helen Keller says, <laughs> nor do the children of men as a whole experience security. Avoiding danger is no safer in the long run than outright exposure. In other words, she's saying, look, if you're afraid to do something, do it. Because not doing it can change you anyhow. So if you want to go out and step out in faith and do something, she says, don't consider what you are the moment secure. I will give you one of Miles Monroe's personal philosophies. Here's my philosophy. If there's something you really want to do, you dreamt of it for years, and an opportunity comes for you to do it, do it. Here's why. Think about how long you're going to be dead. That's why I make decisions. When I was first invited to go to Taiwan, Singapore, I always dreamt of going to the Far East, you know, the Chinese, and to visit those people. I was a little kid, and here comes an opportunity. And I had to travel 18 hours nonstop in a jet from Los Angeles, plus another four hours from Miami, another one hour from the Bahamas. 25 hours in the air. I kept thinking, that's a long way. And the Holy Spirit says, you're going to be dead a long time. 
So I told the guy, I'm coming. I went there to speak at the Full Gospel Businessmen Association. And all these Asian people packed this place. We went up to about 80 story high of a building. Powerful people. And the guy who was the one who invited us was a multi-billionaire. And when I walked in the room, my books were on the table in Chinese. If you fall in love with security, you will never have an adventure. Breaking away from the familiar is the only way to experience life. Some of y'all came here to visit me from another church today. I wonder why you're here. Maybe the Holy Ghost talking to you, saying it's time to change what you're eating. <laughs> Helen Keller is right. It's a blind woman. She says avoiding danger is no safer in the long run than outright exposure. So life is either a daring adventure or nothing at all. There's a blind woman talking to you. One time they asked her on the news, they said, Miss Keller, you are blind. What could be worse than not having sight? She said, not having vision. You don't need eyes to have vision. As a matter of fact, eyes destroy vision. Because you end up living by what you see and not what you dream. Tell your neighbor, close your eyes and go to the future. Resisting change, therefore, is our challenge. Peter Senge says, people don't resist change, they resist being changed. I don't care what you say, this is what I was born like, I'm going to be this way. And you've been that way for how long? <laughs> it ain't change around you that's the problem. It's the fact that there's no change within you. Another statement that I want you to write down. We would rather be ruined than changed. I'm too old to go back to school. Yeah, but you got to learn computer. No child, I, I too old for that. All right. So we're going to encourage you to retire. We can get a package for you. Why? You'd rather be ruined than to be changed. We'd rather die in our dread than to change our way out of this mess. What you are in right now, whatever you're going through, should not be where you end this year. You must prepare yourself to make a logical decision. I'm going to change beginning today some things in my life to take me where I need to go. Here's one that I thought was interesting. Romans chapter 12 said it best. Be ye transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. Now this is an amazing principle. The word transform here means changed. Notice what the Bible says is the key to change. It didn't say be ye transformed by the things happening around you. Because <laughs> you can't control them. He says, be changed by what? The renewing of whose mind? Your mind. In other words, your baby did die. But how are you going to interpret it? Your spouse did leave you. But are you going to make it a prison? You did lose your job, okay? You lost it. You're going to stay home for 10 weeks crying about it? Make a note of this, this statement. You must change the way you think about change. Be ye transformed. Be ye transformed. Not the things around you. Be ye transformed. How? By changing the way you think about things. You cannot control 
most of life. But you can control the way you think about it. And the way you think about it controls your blood pressure. It controls how you sleep. I learned years ago, if you can't change it, go to bed. <laughs> Don't stay up worrying about it because God up all night too. Let him worry about it. You sleep. This is incredible. Uh, the seven responses people have to change. Number one, you cannot resist change. Number two, you cannot ignore change. Number three, you cannot accept change. Rather, you have to accept change. Number four, you must adjust, adjust to change. Number five, you, you can manage change, but you can't stop it. Number six, you can become a victim of change or manipulate change. Number seven, you can prepare and plan for change, but you can't stop it. And number eight, you can initiate change. This to me is the best response. Before you fire me, I can start my own business on the side. Huh? Before I lose this job, I'm going to create a consulting company just in case. Write this down. Plan beyond your job. Why? Ain't nothing secure. The reason why our lives fall apart, the reason why we become so twisted and confused and depressed and even go crazy is because we expected things to say, stay the same. What do you do when your business changes? Do you collapse? Do you, do you stay in bed? Do you hide? Do you, are you ashamed to come up? People think that you're a loser. Initiate change. So I submit to you that time and change are inescapable. And these two things we have to live with. I want you to take this series today. Take this CD, this DVD, and I want you to listen to it seven times until you are convinced that I'm not going to wait for things to happen. I am going to make things happen. I'm going to determine what will happen in my life because something going to happen anyhow. Now, how do you prepare for change? Andrew Law, Andy Law, Andrew said these words. I love it. He says, unless you are prepared to give up something valuable, you will never be able to truly change at all. Can I repeat that? Unless you are prepared to give up something valuable you will never be able to truly change at all why because you'll be forever in the control of the things you can't give up ah. life is about giving up and discovering it's about letting go and holding on to something new Life is about entering and leaving. Life is a passage, not a destination. Life is a constant flow of changes. Some of the best marriages end up on the rocks. Some of the most talented people end up on skid row. They couldn't handle the passage. Another statement I saw that was very intriguing to me is by Nicola Machiavelli. She says, whoever desires constant success must change his conduct with the times. Write that down, please. Whoever desires what? constant success you must be constantly adjusting yourself to the changes in your environment some of you have come to this church for years and you go back with us on Markey Street and you remember we used to sit down and talk on the steps and everybody knew each other 
He called each other by first name. And now look at this place. Wall to wall people. And you can't get to some people in the, in, in, in the room. I won't talk about me. You can't get to me. You got to change with the change. Or you'll die. You end up saying, they don't care about me. They don't call me no more. I haven't seen him. He never worries about me. He doesn't care about me. And you end up with this bit of spirit because things changed, but you didn't. And by the way, if you've been with me for 30 years, you should be praying for people yourself. You should have enough word in you to handle your problems and 10 people around you right now. Change with change. Tell your neighbor. Change with change. Tell somebody else. Change with change. Come on, mean it. Say it in the face. Change with change. One more time. Change with change. Believe me, when change takes place, you better change too. Otherwise, you're going to suffocate. It's going to kill you. It's going to destroy you. Why do we need to change? Robert Quinn says, One key to successful leadership is continuous personal change. Personal change is a reflection of our inner growth and empowerment. Ralph Steyer and James Balecko says, Change is hard because people overestimate the value of what they have write this down this one is very important you think what you have is so valuable you will keep it forever people overestimate the value of what they have and that's why they don't want to change they underestimate the value of what they may gain by giving up what they have so they won't change This young man sitting in the front row gave me a testimony this week. He said, Dr. Monroe, I was laid off on Monday. They released me from the job. And he said, during my time on that job, which was only a short period of probation, I met a lady. And she was a client. And I helped her out with some technical issues. And they released me on Monday. And on Tuesday, I went to see her to, to help her with something. And she said to me, uh, how come you are here? And he said, I, I was released. I was laid off. She said, you want a job? The job is paying twice as much as they was paying him. <laughs> Everybody say, don't ask to underestimate the value of what may be gained by giving up what you have yeah. in a kingdom like ours nobody can fire you all they do is release you to your next position you better clap God right now Let's give him that's, that's the truth right Anne? They, 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 they think they manipulate a kingdom citizen I want you to go to your job or your work tomorrow and tell them, you can't fire me. I was, a, I was assigned to this company for a short time. And I'm on my way to my next position. And when it's time to come for me to leave, even if I won't stay, he's going to make me leave. He's going to use you to get rid of me to go to my next level. Anybody want to go to their next level? This is the kingdom way. And sometimes on your way to your next level, you got to go in a pit. <laughs> sometimes you get locked up in a jail to go to your next level. I'm talking about Joseph now. See, he already know the, the, the assignment, but the, the job, he had a job of a, a pit dweller. They stripped him of all his clothes. They will strip you on your way to your next assignment. But the next one is better. And the reason why they strip you of your clothes 
because the clothing in the next position is so much better. Joseph <laughs> got rid of the coat of many colors and put on a royal robe. Anybody see that coming in their lives? Change is inevitable. Don't be afraid to give up what you're holding on to. And there's some things you love so much, they are holding you back. And it might be people or a habit or a position or a title. And titles are dangerous. Some people live for their titles. Don't ever allow a title to define you. You are always more important than your title. Very important. Now, I want to show you this, how this works. So we got these two items on earth we're trying to deal with, time and change. And the only thing that is guaranteed is time and change. So I've been thinking about this now. This is where we get into the meat for next week. Write this down. The only key to regulating and controlling change and time is planning. Please make a note of that. The only key to regulating and controlling change and time is what? Planning. And that's what we don't do. Matter of fact, we plan our grocery list, but don't plan our lives. We go to a food store with a list, but there's no list of goals for the next 10 years. We control ourselves in the food store because of the list. Imagine controlling your life to the time of your existence on earth. You got to have a list. You got to know what you don't want in life. That list tells you what you don't buy, who you don't associate with, what books you don't read, what places you don't go, what club you don't hang out with in the night, what you don't drink, what you don't smoke to mess up your brain. In other words, this list takes your life and puts it on a course. Without a plan, son, you become a victim of the currents. The only way to control time is planning. The only way to control change is planning. So I want to give you what I call the secret to life. The secret to life is effective management of time and change. Make a note. The secret to life is the effective management of time and change. If you are 16 years old in this room today, or maybe 86 or 96, time is still in your hands. You're still alive. Don't just exist. You gotta manage that time. Number two, secret to life. The principal key to management of time and change is planning. Number three, planning is the most important principle of success in life. You don't stumble into success. You're never successful by mistake. You are successful because you controlled time and you managed change. Key number four. The only regulator of time and change is planning. Time is moving all the time. How do you regulate it? By planning what it will do or what you will do in it. What are you going to do tonight? Are you coming to prayer meeting tonight? Then you start thinking about it right away. You said, I'm coming to prayer meeting tonight. You're planning time. So from 7 to 9.30, you got this plan. That means that chunk of time is already accounted for before it even comes. That's planning. Do that with your year. Do that with your whole 10 years. Let me ask you a question. How old will you be in 10 years? Count, add right now, 10 years from now. How old will you be? Stop counting. See, I told you. You're going to be old. <laughs> yeah. Question. What's going to happen between now and the 10 year? Only one way to control it is planning. Number five, without a plan, time and change will ruin your life. Yeah. 
Planning controls your decisions. I didn't have sex before I was married because I had a plan. I'm a very serious teenager. When I was a teenager, my father's here today. Hi, Dad. My dad is 88 years old. And they used to call me the strange one. That one, he, he can be different, they say. My mother, mother, mother tell me, this, I know about you. You, some of you. Why? I used to ask questions old people ask. When I was 9, 10, 15. So I had a plan for my life when I was 14. So when the girls come around my life and want to have sex, I was tempted now because you know young people are crazy. But I had this plan on a piece of paper. And I would measure the invitation against the plan. And the invitation was overruled by the plan. I wasn't holy. I was just planned. Your plan becomes stronger than your distractions. With all the plan, you're gone. Life will ruin you. You're going to fall for all kinds of things. If you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. And you won't know when you get there because you don't know where you was going. And there are people who I meet who are 60 years old. They grew with me. And they still under the same connect tree. Playing with the same dominoes. No plan. I planned my way out of Baintown. I thank God for my father. You know, my father and my mother, both women and men of faith. I remember when we, when we moved to Baintown. That was a step of faith, eh, Dad? He had no money. Highbury Park had just opened up. And we said, boy, we, you know, we got to... We got to try something. We went up there. I was so used to outdoor toilet. <laughs> Don't even stop imagining things. You all need Jesus. I remember my mother putting the tin tub in the bathtub. Come here, boy. I said, Mom. <laughs> I remember as a boy stooping up on the toilet, stooping up on the toilet. Don't look at me, you ain't that holy. Everybody say change. We changed location, but didn't change our minds. We eventually caught on. I remember growing up in that new house, they used to take the plastic uh, bowl that they used to wash dishes in, in Baintown, Put it in the zinc. <laughs> Look at you all laughing. All you all did that. See, guilty. In other words, we, it didn't hit us. The zinc is the bowl. Anybody did that? Missy Hank. Come on, I'm not alone, right? Oh, great. I'm so glad. Thank you very much. I feel good now. Okay. Yeah, you know, we, we, it, everybody say change with the change. You got to change with the change. Some of you, your life is still in a tin tub. Things have changed. Without a plan, time and change will ruin you. Number, this, this was number six, number seven rather. Change is a process, not an event. Change is what? A process. It's not an event. That's good news, you know. Because if something bad happened to you last week, it was just a process. It's not permanent. You lost money on a deal, it's just a process. It's not permanent. You come in here with disease, it's only a process. Healing is taking place right now in Jesus' name by faith. You will leave here with disease out of your body. Claim it right now in the name of Jesus. It's a process. Nothing is forever in life. And that's the good news. So I want to ask you a question. Who plans? I thought it was interesting. Proverbs chapter 16 verse 9 tells us what kind of people plan. You never saw this before in your life. Here it is. In a heart, 
in his heart a man plans his course but the Lord determines his steps now I want to wrap up on this today we can pick up here next week because this is so critical notice what the scripture says God never plans for your life he has a plan for it he doesn't plan for you the heart of man makes his plans and the Lord directs the steps of the plan say with me in his heart man makes his plans but the Lord determines his steps can you get that let me tell you what is important by the way I learned this as a teenager that's why my life is so precise what is it telling me is if you want God to guide you you must have a plan first so many of us say where's God I don't feel God guiding me uh, God is not leading me anywhere I miss the presence of God where is God the answer is right there the answer is when you say oh Lord help me his answer is with what oh Lord give me money for what oh Lord guide me to where no destination no determination man makes the plans God determines the steps of it notice God determines what the steps not the leaps which means it's a day by day guidance but at least you got a plan and then he guides the steps which means that he determines when something happens in the midst of your plan you may want it to happen this year God said no 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 I got that plan for 216 I don't want to get there too fast why because you got to be prepared for that particular location in your plan you ain't prepared for it so I got to take you through some things to get your maturity to a level where when you get there you can handle the pressure of that new position if some of you had what you have now 10 years ago he would have destroyed you so all the changes in life is really to change you for the change that's coming up ahead so when you come to that place of change you've already been changed for the change it's called maturing in his heart man makes the plan write the word heart down please the word heart here has nothing to do with your chest the word heart in the Hebrew here means mind it actually means your sub mind like your subconscious your your imagination God says I gave you an imagination to make plans and then I'm going to direct the steps of the plan you made so if you don't plan your life he says I can't direct your life if you don't plan where you want to go I cannot guide you to a place where you don't know where you want to go that's why I'm telling you friends in this first month of the year sit down and make a plan for your life give God something to do we pray for God to do things and God don't know why why you want me to do this you ain't going nowhere imagine going to the bank for hundred thousand dollars and the bank says, what you want it for I ain't sure yet Come on, bankers, talk to me. That's the biggest joke in your bank, right? When you want money from a bank, the first thing they ask for is a business plan. They want to see the end before they give you a beginning. They want to see how you plan to get there because that's their security. The only security you have in life is planning life that you can't control. You can't control time so you plan it you can't control change so you plan what you wanted to do to you and when things change you adjust your plan but at least you got a plan to adjust don't just stagger through life in the heart in his mind man makes the plans and the Lord directs the steps of the plan and God gave you a brain this is very important 
and the gift of imagination so that you could participate in creating through planning. I'm going to say this again. God gave you a brain with 500 billion cells and the gift of imagination so that you could participate in creation through planning. <laughs> the future exists in the unseen. Planning allows you to pull it out of the invisible and create the visible. God gave you a brain so he could rest. God says, look, I don't want to do all the work. You're my son. I want you to share the experience of thinking, ideas, concepts, planning, objectives, uh, a strategy, production, and success. Sometimes when you ask the Lord for healing, the Lord says, yeah, I'll heal you. I want you to go get some bush. God said, no, 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 God, I want you to heal me miraculously. God said, I want you to stop eating that certain thing. No, 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 I want healing. God said, listen, I want you to be a part of the process. Stop eating that certain things. Because if I heal you now and clean out your, your, your arteries, you can go right back and poke chop and salad and stuff. I wasted my healing. Be a part and plan your healing. I planned how healthy I am. I planned it. I, I've been a health freak since I was 14 when I started fasting. I went to see my doctor. He gave me a checkup. We had an executive checkup. The guy went in my nose and the head and eye and everything. They went things to places where you're supposed to go. They went everywhere. And the fellow said, you got the body of a young athlete. Plan your long life. Shut down them movies that are messing up your mind. Plan your future by the decisions you make every day. Cut off them friends that ain't taking you to the right direction, man. Stop keeping coming to people always being negative. Plan your conversations with certain people. And know when to leave other people's presence. No one is time to go. So, yeah, it's time for me to go now because what they're talking about ain't happening in my future. And leave the presence of the people. This is very important. Number two, planning is the highest expression of divine nature. God planned the death of Jesus for 4,000 years. That's planning. <laughs> Matter of fact, God's plan for the death of Jesus was longer than 4,000 years, but we don't know the, the length before 4,000 years. But we got a hint. God says, God says, uh, Behold the lamb who was slain when? Before the earth was even made. That means I had already planned just in case you all fell. I killed him before. You all don't know how deep God plans. God said, look, I'm going to make arrangements for redemption that is not necessary yet. I'm going to plan your salvation before you even create it. Just in case you mess up. Calvary was an eternal plan. God is a planner. And when you start becoming a planner, you become like God. You become like your father. He likes that when you start planning. That's why God says, you plan, I direct the steps. You plan, I help you. You plan, I guide you. I like my kids to plan. Are you going to plan this year and plan your way out of where you are? And believe me, friends, don't get stuck by where you are, son. I know where you are is uncomfortable. Don't work on the present too long. Because the present <laughs> is the present. It's full of all kinds of depressions. Planning gives you your life back. It gives you your peace back. It gives you your confidence back. It gives you your joy back. I have a plan. Say it, I have a plan. When you tell people that, you are talking out of the present. You're telling the present, you ain't got me. Say it, I got a plan. Come on, just say it loud. I got a plan. Say it again. 
I got a plan. I want you to say it every day this week. I have a plan. A plan means you ain't staying where you are. You ain't trapped in your present conditions. You ain't allowed it what's going on to keep going on. Say it again. I have a plan. Say it loud, man. Say it louder. Shout loud. I have a plan. Tell your neighbor, I have a plan, girl. Tell your brother, brother, I have a plan. Say it. I have a plan. You can feel the energy of it, huh? I have a plan to come out of where I am at. I have a plan to make things better. I have a plan to improve my life. I have a plan to change my condition. Say it, I have a plan. Say it, I got a plan. You see, when you plan, you participate in divine creativity. Write this down. The capacity to plan, planning, is what distinguishes us from the animal kingdom. I'm going to say it again. The capacity to plan planning is what distinguishes us from the animal kingdom. I've never seen a dog sitting down planning next week. What I can do next week. <laughs> You'll never see a cow meditating on what he's going to do next month. No animal in existence has the power you have. This is why we say animals have instincts. Instinct means you keep reacting to changes. You react to conditions. But a human is different. A human has the power to, de de to design next week. And design it when? Now. That's from God. When you live from day to day, you know there's this song that came out when, um, when Richard was, old, was younger. <laughs> I remember this song. Yes, Richard told me this song. The song says, K Sarah, Sarah, whatever will be, will be. The future my eyes can't see. So Sarah, Sarah. Sarah means whatever happens, happens. What a way to live. That's dumb. My future, my eyes can't see. So what you do is you design the future. You are not a beast. You are just like your father God. You got the ability to sit down and plan a plan that makes you better than anyone else. That's why you will never allow them to relate you to a monkey or a chimpanzee. Monkeys don't plan months ahead. <laughs> so when they start telling about evolution and all this stuff, I tell them, mm -mm -mm, I'm too intellectually put together. To be associated with primates. Prime mate. That ain't my mate. We train monkeys on what to do. And they do it by instinct. By rote. By conditioning. The power of planning is given to humans. And you can plan good or evil. You can plan either way. You get the power. All right, let me give you one more before we go. Write this down. A good plan is like a road map. It shows the final destination and usually the best way to get there. Stanley Hurd. Planning is like a road map. It shows the final destination and usually the best way to get there. That's why a plan helps you manage your time properly. See, it gives you control. It gives you management power of how you're going to deal with resources, relationships, money, time, location, interests, priorities, all these. And that's why God says, I want you to plan. Then I can get involved in your life. One of our members came to me this morning before I came down. She gave me this plan. And she said, Pastor Miles, this is what I want to do next. Had it all laid out. Even taking courses. She said, I just want you to see what I'm doing. I told her, I'm going to help you do that. People come to me. Can I borrow some money? For what? I just need some money. <laughs> Get out of my face. God 
himself said he will not help you until you get a plan. Most of the time in life we ain't broke. We just didn't plan to be rich. When my wife and I were building our house, boy, we had a solid plan. We, we, can, we can get in our house at a certain time. We came out of school. I told my wife, you know, we, we got to save some money to get this property out west. And we got to build our house with our own money. I was working at the government. She working with Shell. So we stayed with my mother-in-law and father-in-law. We lived in a one-room part of the house. Our kids were born in that room. I remember standing in other people's kitchen as a married man cooking on their stove. Why? I had a plan. I, I got to go to my own apartment. Listen, her mother was living in this house with empty rooms. And I wanted to buy. And the mother says, why don't you all stay here? Now we got some fellas in here who are so cookie. I'm going to save my mother-in-law. Brother, my house paid for, you know, and it's worth over a million dollars. But I had to spend those first few years living in my mother-in-law's home. Because we had a plan. We weren't staying there because he was lazy. We weren't staying there because we was trying to, you know, live off them. We were staying there because we had a plan. And the plan required, you got to save a certain amount every month to get a down payment on that property. So the plan required, you can't spend it on rent. A good plan will make you humble. A good plan will get rid of your pride. Pastor Richard and Sheena. When they first got married, same story. They lived with a lady called Sister Edith. And she didn't charge them anything. Imagine a married couple. Mother Edith, that's Mother Edith. Aunt Edith. Aunt Edith. And all of us, we were all young fellas struggling. You know, now he got a nice house too. And in the same area. Oh, some of y'all think we're born the way we look at. We had a plan. Everybody say plan. Say so get a plan. A plan will take away your ego. If you know where you're going, sometime you got to go through a track road. Yep. Oh, come on, y'all talk to me now. You know, you can't get somewhere that says, this part of the road ain't paid, but you got a destination. So you got to go through a track road to get to a highway. Get a plan. And stop being proud. Some of y'all plan yourself into poverty. Because your plan you can't afford. make plans by giving getting advice my hope my prayer for you as my family you are the most important people to me I travel all over the world I speak to millions but I am so concerned about you you have to be the trophy that God says come and see how it works in the Bahamas if you don't get it here they gonna get it out there you have to make this work your success is a model for the world. I want you to leave here convicted that you're going to stop wasting time. I want you to leave this place today with a decision. I'm going to get me a plan together. I'm going to sort out my life for the next five years. Make a five-year plan and then a ten-year one and then a one-year one. Break them down and then say, God, here's what I want you to direct for me. Now, direction is important, you see, because he may direct you a live differently than you expected but he can get you to your destination but you got to have a plan close your bibles please read this verse out loud please proverbs 20 put it back up please proverbs 20 verse 18 read out loud go make plans by seeking advice if you wage war obtain guidance make a note of that please this is in the bible I've gone into church meetings and I said, uh, what's going on? The Holy Ghost will lead us. What do you mean by that? 
This meeting is under the power of the Holy Ghost, the guidance of the Holy Ghost. So you got no plan for the meeting? No, no, the Holy Ghost leads us. This is crazy. <laughs> God says, if you don't have no plan, the Holy Ghost has nothing, nothing to lead. Some people are so spiritual, they are stupid. But whatever the Lord wants, that's what I can do. No, the Lord reversed it. Whatever you want, I'm going to do. Are you listening to me? Ten years from now, you should be a different woman in a different position in life. Your past wasn't too solid. Some things happened that you couldn't control. But your future, you can control it, my dear Shirley. You can control it. I want you to leave here today saying, I got a new plan. I can make another plan. If you can make another plan, your life can have another life. Make plans by what? Seeking advice. Proverbs 21 5. Read out loud. Go. The plans of the diligent lead to profit as surely as haste leads to poverty. The plans of the diligent lead to what? Profit. That's what anybody wants. We want to make profit. But haste. Rushing into things, not thinking, rushing into life every day without a plan, brings you down to what? Poverty. I told you you can plan poverty. You plan poverty by not having a plan for wealth. The purpose and power of prayer devotional. Go through that and study it every day. And then there's a prayer in that I put every day for you to pray. It keeps you in the focus of prayer. It also helps you to organize your devotional time for your family. And you can use this book to have devotion for your family, to pray around it as an altar. And the book also helps you to learn precepts and principles concerning prayer and how to implement those things in your life. This is the book I strongly urge you to read. Uh, someone said to me on Friday night at the meeting, said that, Pastor Miles, people need to read this book. This book is deeper than I thought. It's my second time reading it and I'm finally understanding some of it. I tell you, friends, uh, I was reading it myself last night because I wanted to review a few things in it, and I got caught up in my own book and started getting excited. And I, I was reading the chapter on the 10 specific things you do to prepare for prayer. And Because prayer, you don't just walk into God's presence. There's a protocol you have to go through. And I did research in the Bible to study God's requirements to enter his presence. And sometimes we think that it's just the blood of Jesus. It's not. There's protocols that you must understand to understand how to enter a king's presence to get effective response. And I am very pleased to tell you that this book has been on the bestsellers list for six months and still is because people are buying the book on prayer. Uh, Benny Hinn has rated this his best book he's ever read on prayer and uh, he said it's the most practical. Well, I am very happy that people are beginning to study prayer at a different level. And that is understanding how it works. And I want you to take that book this next month and read it, study it, and apply it. I actually give you how-tos in the book because I practice prayer daily in my life and I know how important it is to understand how it works. As a matter of fact, today's teaching is to deal with a question, how to pray. I want to begin with a few statements you want to write down. How valuable is prayer? How important is prayer? The answer is in some statements that I want you to take a look at. Everything God is and has is available to mankind through prayer. It doesn't just happen. It has to come to us through prayer. So if you want access to what God has, which he wants you to have, matter of fact, it was he who says, no good thing will he withhold from anyone who walks uprightly. So all of his good things he wants you to have. But the access you use to get it is prayer. Secondly, there is a principle that I, principle that I discovered recently, and that's the reason I'm talking about for the past 29 years of my life. Because when I grew up in the churches I grew up in, I never learned how to pray. They used to say, just talk to God. Uh, that's not true. 
Prayer is not just talking to God. I want to correct that today. There's a way to do prayer. And prayer doesn't just happen because you talk. Without prayer, God cannot, and without, without man, God won't do anything on the earth. And yet man can't get anything done on earth without God. So here's the principle. Without God, man cannot, and without man, God will not. God will not do anything on earth without man, and man can't do anything on earth without God. In other words, prayer is a corporate activity between heaven and earth, and man is God's strategy for prayer. Here's what I discovered. More work is done by prayer than work itself. Martin Luther King, sorry, Martin Luther King, Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King. Martin Luther, who was the, the famous Catholic priest who instigated the Protestant movement because of his faith that he discovered, said this. He said, the more work I have to do in the day, the more time I spend in prayer in the morning. What an attitude. The harder I must work in the day, the longer I pray in the morning, he says. No wonder why he changed the world. No wonder why it was his obedience to God that produced a global movement called Protestants. Because he was in the bowels of prayer. How did Martin Luther King get to this? Martin Luther King, forgive me. It just kind of comes off, doesn't it? How did this wonderful priest, Martin Luther, get to discover the revelations in the book of Romans chapter 1? It was that chapter he was reading, he says, and it exploded in his face, and he went and reported what he discovered to his bishop and got in trouble. Because when you are a man or woman of prayer, God reveals things to you. More work is done by prayer than work itself. Therefore, Prayer is the key. Now, to understand prayer, here's some things that you need to know. First of all, the legal authority on earth is in the hands of humans. That means anything on earth that doesn't happen through a human is illegal. That's because, number two, God will never violate his laws that he created and he will never break his word. God's word was, let the man have dominion over the earth. When God makes a law, he himself doesn't violate it. That is why he is called holy. He has integrity. He does not break his own law. And God's law was, humans are going to run the earth and they are going to rule the earth on my behalf. A human is a spirit in a dirt body. So the dirt body is the secret to legal power on earth. I repeat, the dirt body is what? The secret to what? The legal power on earth. That's why the most important thing you possess on earth right now is your physical body. When you lose your body on earth, you leave. Why? Because you become illegal. This is why the scriptures teach. When you are absent from the body, you are immediately present with the Lord. Why? You are no longer legal here. Let me give you a little motivation to pray for healing a little better. When you are physically challenged by any kind of challenge, pain or disease, don't ask God to heal you because you're hurting. Wrong reason. Ask God to heal you or deliver you from it because it is good for him. Hmm. Lord, heal me because you need this. You know, I was telling you all when I was, I had a little neck 
problem, a, a pinched nerve. And I went to the doctor, did all this stuff, all the, all the stuff, and they started taking my money. One day I'm home, looking at this, this pill. This pill cost $90. I said, okay, I got a choice here. Give God my money or keep spending it on this stuff. Your pastor got mad that day. You remember I came and told you I was healed. I told God, look, this body ain't no good to you like this. I have to go. You give me a schedule. You got to send me to go preach. Heal me now. I went to sleep, woke up, and got out of bed. And it was gone. I didn't say heal me so I can feel better. Your body is necessary for God. Let me quote a verse from the book of Corinthians chapter 6. Paul says, As food is for the stomach, and the stomach is made for food, even so the body was made for God, and God, that's the part I couldn't understand, is made for the body. That's in your Bible. How can, be God, how can God be made for a body? Because God made the body just for him. He knew he would need it. Glory, hallelujah. Lift your hand right now and say, Lord, fix your access. Now some of y'all, you know, some of y'all don't know. See, let me tell you why I always just thank God for healing me. I don't wait till I get sick to get healed. Because sometimes when you're sick, it's because it finally showed up. It was there a long time ago. So don't sit there cute. Lift your hands right now and say, Lord, fix your vessel, even from secret disease, in my body. Little growths, I can't see yet, feel yet. Heal me now, in Jesus' name, for your sake. Give him a praise. Hallelujah. You heal me for your sake. Write this down, number three. Nothing will happen on earth without mankind. That's why God wants you to stay close to him. He don't want you to come to him because he wants you in heaven. He wants you in him, to him because he needs you on earth. That's why God becomes very upset when you spend your time, this is the old statement, shucking, and jiving, playing games, hanging out in nightclubs, discos, lapping up garbage, wasting your time with people who aren't doing it. He hates that. Why? Because he can't use you and he needs you. God didn't redeem you because he is sorry for you. He redeemed you because he needs you. Hallelujah. I say, some of you are supposed to shout right there, you miss it. His redemption was for his sake. Glory, hallelujah. He redeemed you so he could use your access. Because he gave you the power to influence earth. Write this down, number four. God cannot interfere in earth without the cooperation of a human. This is why God uses dependency terms when he talks about prayer he uses conditions when he talks about prayer he used words like if then if then why because if you don't do this then i can't do that if you don't do this then i can't do that he depends on us to get things done in the earth number five very important man holds the power of license on earth a lot of people got problems with this concept. But that is exactly why our prayers are not answered. Because we got problems with the concept. We believe that God can do anything on earth, anytime, anywhere, to anyone, in any way he feels like. Let me just make another statement. A sovereign God can sovereignly limit his sovereignty to make you sovereign. I'm going to say that slow, get this CD. A sovereign God has the sovereign power 
to limit his sovereignty to make you sovereign. God is also sovereign enough to not break his own law. Lord have mercy. It's too deep. God is interesting. God loves you so much. He wants you to share his power. Let them have dominion. Let them feel what it feels like to dominate a territory like I dominate the universe. I want my kids to feel what daddy feels when he's in charge. Okay, let me say something very interesting. This is very important. Do you know that they have so far counted over 580 million planets? I'm sorry, galaxies. A galaxy is is a collection of solar systems. We are only one of them in this solar system. We got nine planets in our solar system. Every solar system has a sun with planets going around it. They discovered 500 million. Now, when you multiply that, that's billions of planets. Do you know that they have never, ever recorded two planets clashing? I want you to follow this now. Follow me carefully, please. Do you know why nothing clashes out there? That's his territory. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Oh, Lord, I feel like running. He got his situation all organized. But when you look at what he left in our hands, <laughs> we ain't doing a good job so he says tell you what let me help you all let me help you bring order to the planet give me permission to come in and bring order the way I handle in these planets out here when you lock God out, collisions take place. When Adam kicked God out of the garden, then God kicked him out of his garden. First result, family on family crime. Two brothers clashed. One was killed. We have not survived it since. Who's killing our young men? Our young men. Who's raping our young women? Our young men. He says, let me in please. Why? Because you were not designed to live without the designer. The earth is the Lord's. Man's declaration of authority to earth was given to us by God. Let's read Psalm 115 verse 15 and those of you at home please get your Bibles. Those of you watching us my, my daughter and son I know you're watching us in Texas and New Jersey and Antoine watching us and Brother Chan watching us out there in uh, California. God bless you all. They always call in and write in and tell us what they're doing. You know uh, Brother Argentina your folks there in London already finished church. God bless you all. All tuned in. Churches all the way in Afghanistan. I watch, give them a big hand. I got an email from Afghanistan. They're watching us live every Sunday. One pastor wrote me, he says, when the internet went off, I didn't have my sermon for the week. This is in India. He tunes in every day, every weekend to watch this teaching, to teach his people in India. This is not just about us. There are millions being affected by that camera every day. That's why I tell the camera people, we need more camera people to work on the camera, please, and get the word of God out as ambassadors. Look at this. Read it loud. Psalm 115 verse 15. Read. May you be blessed by the Lord, who? The maker of heaven and earth. Okay, read. The highest heavens is his territory. Okay, no problem. That's in order. But the earth, he gave to you. If you don't like what's happening on earth, it is your fault, God says. Stop blaming God about poverty and all the crime. God ain't nothing to do with that. 
God gave you the responsibility. We are as poor as we make our people. We have as much crime as we allow and train our kids to have. We destroy as many marriages as we want to destroy. We violate our physical laws and destroy our bodies with drugs and all kind of promiscuity and, and all kind of perversion because we decide that. God didn't do that. Can't blame him. What we need is to invite him in. Oh Lord, we need help. I say, oh Lord, we need help. Oh, please. <laughs> Look at Mark 11. Jesus was telling us how, how much power you have on earth. Here's Mark 11 with 24. Read. Therefore, I tell you, when whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Why? They say, you got to ask for it. Why can't God just do it? Here's why. Look at the next Matthew 16, 19. Read. I will give you what? The keys. What do keys do? They open or lock up. They give access or they stop things from happening. I will give you what? The keys of the kingdom of heaven. That means access to heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Write the word bind and loose down please. The word bind means to stop or to lock up. The word loose means to allow or to open. He says, what happens on earth, notice the word earth at the last verse there. He says, whatever happens on earth depends on what you lock up or you open. That means God can't just come and open. He said, no, you have to lock it up and then I lock it up. You open it, I open it. The power on earth is up to you. Here's the way I put it. God got the power, you got the license. God got the power, you got the permission. God's got the power, you got the access. And if you don't give him access, his power remains in heaven. Very important. You got the power. Here's what I want to say about prayer. Now please write this down. Everyone, write this in your Bible, please. So you can remember what prayer is, so you can do it every day. This is why I pray every day, all day. Number one, this word prayer is an amazing word. The, the Hebrew word for prayer that's used all through the Bible, and this is one of the most common words used, is this word, antikas. An antichus or anti it actually means petition. Very important word. It means to entreat an authority, entreaty. To actually present a case before a judge. To, to present a petition to a government. That's what the word prayer means. In other words, uh, in the earliest parchments that they found in the Hebrew language, the oldest writings, they find that this word actually means a petition to a superior. So when you talk about you praying, first there got to be a government, then there got to be constitutional laws, so you can have a, a petition. You can't petition unless there was promises. You can never petition unless there was some rights given. So petition requires the prerequisite of constitutional rights, which means that you can only pray if there is a government who gave you a constitution that has rights in it concerning you. Prayer, therefore, is not a religious activity. Prayer is a governmental activity. Prayer is basically a political act. Petitioning is not a religious act. It is a governmental act. And that's why the word is used in the Hebrew. anti -exis. This word means you must bring petition to the government, the authority. Now, to understand that then, uh, let's take another look at what prayer is. I'm going to give you some definitions to write down. And these ones, I cultivated these over 30 years. These are my results of study and understanding the mind of God and the Bible. Study, study, study. Number one, prayer is earthly license for heavenly interference. Number two, prayer is mankind giving God permission to interfere in earth's affairs. Number three, prayer is heaven's power impacting earth through man's earthly authority. Prayer is heaven's power impacting earth through man's earthly authority. Number four, prayer is mankind. I'm getting a feedback, sir. You all got to stay attention back there. Prayer is mankind giving heaven authority to perform God's word on earth. This one is very critical. 
Prayer is what? Read it for me. Mankind giving heaven authority to perform God's word where? On earth. One more time. Prayer is mankind giving heaven God to perform God's word on earth. In other words, God wants to do what he said on earth, but he cannot perform what he said unless someone gives him permission to do it. You know, the prophet said this Isaiah, he says, God watches over his word to perform it. In other words, he's constantly waiting for one human somewhere to put his word in their mouth and then tell him, do it. And then now he has permission to perform that word in the earth. Very important. This therefore is what prayer is. Prayer is you not coming to God with your words. Prayer is you taking to God his words and then telling him, you can do it through my authority you gave me. This is why Jesus said, the Father judges no man. He has given all authority of judgment to the Son of Man. Because I am a man, he says, God has given me access and I speak only the words of my Father. Remember he said that? I do not say anything of myself, only what my Father says. Why? Because that's all I want. Now this is why when you have a problem in life, you should never say the problem. I should park right here for two weeks and just preach here. Because see, your tongue is your problem. The worst thing to do in life is to describe what's happening to you. You all better hear me. People ask me all the time, how you doing? I will tell them I ain't got no problem. They think I'm joking with that. I say in that because that's true. I want that to happen. And when I say it, it is. Let the weak say, why? Because the Lord is my strength and my song, the Bible says. Let the poor say, rich, why? Because he who was rich became poor so that I can become rich. He said, don't say you broke. Just say, it coming. Hallelujah. The Bible says, by the mouth of the wicked, the city is destroyed. Let me say it again. By the mouth of the wicked, the city is destroyed. I need some more volume, please. He says, but by the words of the righteous, it is established. Every, that's, you know, I sit in a media place. I say, why do you all keep putting the murder front page big all the time? They say, well, we just report what happens. I said, that's why it keeps happening. If you keep saying something, it's established. Well, you know, we got to be true to journalism. We need some anointed journalism who got vision. Let's speak that the Bahamas is a blessed place. There is no crime. There is peace in our streets. And the young people are behaving. And young people are submitted to adults. And adults are behaving themselves, staying married. Amen. Don't look at me. Say amen. amen. Let me tell you something. Your tongue, the Bible says, has death and life in it. Jesus said, and when you pray, believe what you say he says and if you believe what you said it shall come to pass so you don't you don't wait till you see it you say it till you see it God's word is the only thing he performs he doesn't form perform your description of your problems <laughs> I was impressed by uh, the first chapter of the Bible. First three verses. I love it. It's so deep. It says, And darkness was upon the face of the deep. Okay, that's what God saw. Some of your, your life is like that right now. Everything you see is dark. That's why God sent you to this meeting this morning. To listen to your senior pastor. To tell you, stop telling people what you see. But I know how I can make it. I know how I can pay this. And I know what can happen next month. And Lord, they're coming to repossess this. And Lord, because if you just shut your mouth. I'm talking to someone. Yeah. 
Prayer is not telling God what's wrong. Prayer is telling him what he promised to fix what's wrong. <laughs> God saw the darkness. Okay. I mean, it's obvious you broke. Hold that for me because I'm getting heat hot right here. See, you stop telling us you ain't feeling good. You know you ain't feeling good. So keep that to yourself. Don't share your bad feelings with everybody. Because what you're doing, you're compounding it. You're giving the devil a lot of work to perform. Hallelujah. God could see. Write this down. Never pray what you see. Pray what you desire. God wanted light. He saw dark. So the next three words says, and God said. Now God saw, but he didn't say what he saw. He said what he desired. That's prayer. You know, Paul says, I've been in many afflictions, but nothing can separate me. Paul had such a positive speech. Paul said, because I believe, therefore I speak. You don't speak what you see. You speak what you believe. Tell your neighbor, I coming out. I know what you're in, but say it again. I am coming out. Now say this. He promised me. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. But my Lord I don't feel like running. Praise God. When they ask you how you're doing, tell them. I am in the shell. I am being delivered. Say it. Say it loud. Stand up on your feet and scream it loud. One more time. Shout it loud. Give God a praise and sit down. Hallelujah. You don't say what you see in prayer. How you doing? I'm being delivered. How your family? Being delivered. How that son, that wavered boy? Being delivered. How your marriage? Lord, being delivered. Come on, give God a praise. I'm being delivered. That's the word, Pastor. He is looking for you to give him his word to perform. Prayer is not about complaining. It's about proclaiming. <sighs> Tell your neighbor, I am strong. I'm strong. Hey boy, kick your knee. Say, I'm strong. I'm strong. Next knee, I'm strong. I'm strong. Next time your knee said, I can I just say, I am strong. He said, let the weak say. He didn't say feel. He say say. Oh, glory. Cut God a big hand. He said, don't wait till you feel it. He say say it. My back is good. How you doing? My back is good. He said, give me something to work on. Hallelujah. God don't perform bad things. No good thing will he withhold. He, he, he don't, Lord, for pain. God said, God perform the pain. The devil said, thank you. I used that. And give me more pain. Palm. The devil performs things too, see? Yeah. You know, this, this new book they bought out that you all wasted your money on. And what, the secret? I give you all the secret right there. The whole book is about that. Say positive what you want. They stole that from God and didn't give him credit. Don't buy no secret. You got it in your hand. That book right there in your hand, that's a secret right there. Give God a big praise. Don't waste your money no more. <laughs> Tell your neighbor, I feel rich. Hallelujah. Say it, I am rich. Don't wait till no money come. Give him something to perform so he can get it to you. I was telling God that I was dead free for years. And it seemed like it was taking long, you know. But I was giving him something to work with. So please don't be jealous of me. And I confess the same thing over this ministry. 
that we shall be debt free in Jesus name so we can build those buildings out there tell your neighbor I am a giver let me tell you what your goal should be in life to just be a giver everything you get you don't need you hear me I prophesy, I pray, lift your hand, get the prophecy, that the day will come in your life when your salary will be what you give away. In the authority of God, I pray. Come on, give God praise. Say it, so let it be unto me, just as you have spoken, Lord. That's what Mary told the angel. Mary is a little teenager, ain't never had no sex. The man said, but you're going to have a baby. Mary didn't say, well, I feel nothing. And ain't no man, I ain't got no man. So that can't happen. She said, be it unto me, just like you have said. Lift your hand right now and say it. Lord, this is your week. Be it unto me, just like you have spoken it. This is the day that you have made. I'm going to rejoice every day and be glad. I'm a happy person. See, I'm a happy person. Speak. And he performs. Write this down, please. The seven. I mean, the, the, uh, why heaven needs your prayer? Look at Matthew 18. Read it aloud. Verse 19. She's speaking. Again, I tell you that if two of you, any two of you on earth, on where? Earth. That's important. See, not in heaven. You don't got no power in heaven. On earth, if two of you agree about how many things? Anything, he says. And you ask God to do it. Watch him now. 